Good afternoon. My name is Marek Michalewicz. I'm the director of uh, Interdisciplinary Center for Mathematical and Computational Modeling, University of Warsaw. And uh, I, it's in short, ICM. ICM has been hosting this uh, virtual series of uh, seminars in computer and computational science since uh, late March this year. And that uh, came about as a follow up from our uh, conference uh, Supercomputing Frontiers Europe that we have run for the sixth time this year in March. And unfortunately this year we had to decide very quickly within two weeks before the conference date, we decided to run it as a virtual event. It worked uh, pretty well with uh, over 50 presentations over three full days of, conf of the conference. And instead of 200 or 300 re registered uh, participants, we managed to have uh, over 1,000 participants from 67 countries. Uh, that, that was a very new and surprising experience for us. And since uh, so many, most of the countries are in a lockdown or have been in lockdown with the restricted uh, communication and possibilities of uh, live participation, we decided to run this, uh, those seminars and we, were, we still are very, very fortunate to, to, to have a sort of stellar uh, group of uh, speakers. Uh, so today we are very uh, honored and privileged to uh, host, to have uh, Professor Sarah Kenderdein from uh, Lausanne, Switzerland previously from Sydney and previously from other places, Perth perhaps, I guess, or some Hong Kong, some yeah. Hong Kong and then various other places. And uh, of course, uh, uh, I won't be talking about the, the topics. Uh, the title of the talk is Cultural Data Sculpting. Uh, I'm very excited and, and, and we're looking forward to this talk. I've heard Professor Kenderdine speak as a keynote speaker and other international conference, and that was uh, really fascinating. So I'm uh, very happy to, that we can have it here. And uh, of course, you are welcome to, to, to check uh, Professor Kenderdine's web, web uh, site. And uh, a very interesting thing I've read today that you have a marine archaeologist and you wrote uh, books about the uh, shipwrecks so so that's a uh, very sort of uh, colorful and, and exciting uh, but whatever uh, professor Kenderdine does is, is uh, most certainly it's it's, uh, it's exciting it's brilliant and it's uh, of course also visually beautiful and uh, challenging uh, let me just very quickly use this opportunity to intro to sort of uh, what your appetite for the next week the next week you will have a also very interesting seminar given by uh, Stephen Wolfram from uh, Wolfram Research. Uh, very well known personality around the world, everywhere, known for mathematical language and for his uh, books and his uh, uh, extremely sort of uh, wide uh, ranging uh, interests and, and explanation of, of uh, of the world, natural world, in terms of uh, cellular automata, the new kind of science, and uh, and the recently very very uh, challenging new paper. We'll see. We'll see what uh, what, what what new ideas uh, uh, Stephen Wolfram will share with us. That will be next week. Uh, then let me acknowledge that we have uh, uh, very loyal and supportive uh, media partners. It's Datanami, HPC Wire. Enterprise AI, IT Wiz, Stuchna Intelligencia, and Computer World. Uh, then, if you missed our past seminars, you can watch all of them. Uh, we have footage of, of every every uh, previous seminar. Uh, equally, we'll have uh, the next this one as well. Uh, in two weeks' time, uh, we won't have any any seminar. And one very important reason is that we won't be competing with our uh, good friends uh, from ISC, International Supercomputing Conference in Germany, which has uh, been running since 1986, the most important conference on supercomputing in Europe. 
on uh, Thursday, 25th of June, there is a session with workshops. Here's the list of those workshops. I encourage you all interested in supercomputing, high-performance computing, storage, computing methods to participate uh, in this conference. This uh, year it's online and it's free. Uh, so there's no uh, real obstacles in, uh, particip for participation. Uh, so that will be the whole week of uh, from 22nd to 25th of uh, June. And uh, so now with this, I welcome Professor Sarah Kenderdine. Uh, and the, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marek, and thank you to everyone who has helped set this up. I'm going to start with a, a little scene setting, um, a little bit of theory, I guess um, you could say. And, uh, and then we'll get into a series of projects that we've created really over the last um, 10 years uh, span, um, although we've been busy with this for much longer. So uh, it was more than 120 years ago in 1889 that the curator at the Smithsonian Institute, G.B. Good, delivered a lecture called The Future of the Museum, in which he said this future museum would stand side by side with the library and the laboratory. And what we see now is the convergence in collecting organizations propelled by the liquidity of digital data that now sees them reconciled as information providers in this networked world. Media theorists have described this world order as a database logic where users transform the physical assets of museums into digital assets to be uploaded, downloaded, visualized, shared. Users who treat institutions not as storehouses of physical objects, but rather as data sets to be manipulated. And what this lecture explores is how these mechanistic descriptions can be replaced by the ways in which computation can become experiential, spatial, materialized, embedded and embodied through various participatory, interactive and immersive regimes inside galleries, libraries, archives and museums. So uh, this, in fact, is a work by uh, Jeffrey Shaw, seminal media artist, but it really evokes for me um, one of these uh, modalities of new experiences of data. It was developed for a cave in 1995, and there are potentiometers in all of the joints that allow you to manipulate this world in real time. When you close the puppet's eyes, you in fact go between one world and the next. So my research sits at a convergence of aesthetic practice, cu cultural big data, if you like, and um, 20 years uh, of designing interactive frameworks for public engagement with cultural heritage. Initially, I was working um, at after I stopped being a maritime archaeologist. I joined uh, Museum Victoria and started to build these large-scale systems uh, for mass public. I then started to collaborate with universities to try and sustain this architecture and put a research framework around the types of projects that we wanted to build. Um, this is the iCinema Research Centre at UNSW in Sydney, which still exists. Um, I then moved to Hong Kong and established with uh, Jeffrey Shaw, in fact, the um, Applied Laboratory for Interactive Visualization and Embodiment, which was located at the Science Park in Hong Kong, 1,000 square meters of large-scale vis machines. Um, I then returned to Australia as part of UNSW and founded the Expanded Perception and Interaction Center, um, I developed two systems here. One is a full dome, uh, which is touring, and the other one is a small seven meter diameter panorama comprised of 56 projectors and 29 computers. So in fact, it's on the edge of human visual acuity, and it was really designed to solve 
visualization challenges for complexity in big data in the humanities and the sciences. It became increasingly of interest to medical um, researchers. This is phenome network visualization that we did with Imperial College in London, subcellular microscopy um, in which uh, 53 parameters are reduced to a 3D space through to uh, work for the full dome in molecular um, proteins found in your blood. And I thought this was appropriate to show because it's the common cold, the rhinovirus um, magnified one billion times. This is uh, animation actually done by Drew Berry, who's an award-winning um, medical animator at Weehigh in, in Melbourne. Um, and I, then I was invited by EPFL to come to Switzerland um, to focus again on uh, cultural heritage. And so I founded the um, Laboratory for Experimental Museology. I have a 1,500 square meter space, um, big warehouse, and eight large scale systems. And uh, these systems offer us strategies for multi-sensory engagement emphasizing human to human as well as human to machine interaction and give us powerful ways to reformulate narrative in a digital context. So the types of uh, data that the labs are using are laser scanning data, which collects billions of points to represent places such as these heads at Mount Rushmore scanned by the Scottish 10. Um, we can create precious objects in 3D and peer inside to see what was previously unseen. We can capture art in a way that allows us to zoom into the tiniest brushstroke, um, revealing more than uh, the naked eye can see. Uh, between 1,200 dpi and 5,000 dpi. And then we're working increasingly with a convergence between machine learning and photogrammetry. Um, and in this case, it's Nefertari's tomb in Egypt, Valley of the Queens, um, eight hours of photogrammetry to create this 40 million pixel model um, where everything is removed using machine learning, all the air conditioning, all the stairs and this sort of thing. Uh, and a particular interest of mine is also in uh, intangible cultural heritage. And I'll show you a couple of those projects. Here you're looking at um, South Chinese Kung Fu um, and a kind of analytic uh, type um, animation based on motion capture, motion over time analysis. So my... Um, my talk is structured around four main themes um, and is really a, a realization of a whole range of research projects on the theme of inhabiting cultural imaginaries, um, interactive archives, encoding embodied knowledge and deep mapping. So I thought to start here in India, um, a lot of my work has been in Asia, mainly because as a maritime archeologist, I was working on the Indian Ocean program for excavation in Oman, China, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, the Maldives, Cambodia. And um, this knowledge of Asia led to a range of invitations to work there. Uh, so this is the Prince of Wales Museum in Mumbai. Um, and it was adopted as the epicenter of an artistic exploration that specifically focuses on the ceiling architectures of Mumbai's heritage and contemporary buildings and transforms them into an urban celestial imaginary. So we shot 160 gigapixels throughout the city um, and Mumbai's heritage architecture is unrivaled actually in India, if not the world. It has the largest representation of neo-Gothic style architecture, um, huge number of um, Indo-Saracenic buildings, and also one of the world's largest concentrations of Art Deco buildings in any city. So it's quite an architectural wonderland. Um, this is the Baudrillard Museum. Um, but also we did a few contemporary buildings, including Terminal 2, the new Mumbai airport. 
So then we took the dome that I built in Sydney and put it under this 60 foot dome in Mumbai. And uh, it was a work that about 2000 people a day were coming there really to just lie down and look up. It uses a very simple computer vision algorithm that selects any image randomly and then creates a unique uh, transition every time between these two images. It's actually a very old algorithm um, and uh, obviously open to mass public. It has soundscape, but uh, in fact, on this particular video, for some reason, it's not in there. So um, you'll have to imagine famous uh, classical Indian music as part of this experience. Became very popular with the architecture departments. It's also true that most of these buildings, even though they're public heritage buildings, they're very socially exclusive. So it was the only um, place that these people um, could actually see their own heritage. And yeah, there's a lot of theory about um, full domes and the way they work in a, in a perceptual sense, um, but uh, we can probably leave that for um, another discussion. So this work, also for the Full Dome, uh, is um, a collaboration with the National Museum of Australia. And we created two dome shows um, called, called Travelling Kankarangalpa. And it's the song line of the Seven Sisters, so it's indigenous material. And uh, the song line portrays one of the most predominant meta-narratives in mainland Australia. Um, that it was never ever told in the public domain before. And uh, it's a kind of morality tale. It's also connected to the Orion and Pallades in the night sky. Um, and it's got a, seven sisters and one lustful Wadi Nero who's chasing them through the landscape. Uh, the first work here involves um, photogrammetry of a cave which had never ever been photographed before. It was seven year negotiation with the indigenous community to, to get access. Uh, then it's gigapixel imaging, um, drone based panoramas, uh, time lapse photography of the night sky in that area and um, ambisonics. So there was a whole uh, range of different modalities for that particular work. The next one um, was working with the artists from that community and their artwork. So this one, in this image, you see these grass figures, these jumpy figures designed by the ladies. They represent the seven sisters. They were collected by the National Museum as objects. Um, and so we created photogrammetric models of them. And then the artists painted, collectively painted all of the uh, imagery for the full dome, which was then uh, animated as part of these narrative sequences that we built. They're actually very complex images, uh, and uh, so the the way in which they unfold in the dome helps to um, to map the narrative to the visual components um, that you see here. This uh, snake figure is, in fact. Um, uh, the incarnation, if you like, of the what of the lustful um, predator that was uh, central to this story. So, as mentioned, this was a seven-year negotiation by the museum with the community. Um, the community came to the museum and said, "Our song line is dying. So, what are them? How can you? Um, how can you help us?" Um, rebring it into the public domain. So for sacred knowledge, it was very, very important and a watershed also in the National Museum Government of Australia relationship with Indigenous peoples of Australia, um, which have not been the best over the years. Um, so it was a very seminal work 
curatorial work in that sense. Um, this project here uh, is at the Dunhuang Caves in China. It's from 2012. Uh, and um, it's the nexus of the Silk Road. It's 492 caves carved into this escarpment in this cliff face. And inside these temples are 45,000 square meters of mural paintings and frescoes and over two and a half thousand statues uh, crafted by Buddhist monks over a period of a thousand years. This sublime art treasury is like nothing else in the Chinese Buddhist world. Really important things were found here, including the earliest Chinese star map of the Chinese constellations, the earliest book in the world, um, the Diamond Sutra was found amongst this material in something they call a library cave. All of this material was removed by explorer archaeologists and now is distributed across 18 countries. Um, although there is a project which has been running out of the British Library to digitize all this material and in a sense digitally repatriate it um, or at least uh, bring it all together. The caves themselves are under massive threat from rising visitor numbers. Um, the Dunhuang Academy have about 60, between 60 and 90 full-time photographers working on site. They do camera array photography, they laser scan separately. So when we met them, they hadn't actually brought these two together, which was something that we trained them to do. Um, and then we worked, um, you can see them here, uh, stitching all the data together in real time or more or less, you know, um, to check that they don't make any errors as they move through the process. So it's quite a mechanical and simple process, but it also requires a fair amount of vigilance, you could say. So we took the wireframe from the laser scan and the texture data to create pure land inside the Magal grottos at Dongwan. So it's in a 360 degree 3D immersive environment. It's 10 meters across, four and a half meters high. So it allows about 30 people a one-to-one -one scale experience of being inside the cave. So this is the system from Hong Kong and you're able to go inside cave 220 um, and then you're inside a digital model. If you go to the site itself, you are with about 60 people and one LED torch flashing around. So in fact, the experience of being in these caves is quite um, challenging. But because it's a digital cave, of course, you can um, uh, light it up. We used a magnifying glass so you could examine the murals in great detail. The Dunhuang Academy did recoloring of the murals based on their pigment studies. Looks quite bright. Just students made tiny little animations. So it was a very modest um, and no budget project. We uh, modeled all of the uh, instruments in 3D. Um, to represent the 32 musicians in the painting. Um, we filmed Beijing Academy dancers in a green screen studio and inserted their video in the scene. So a range of um, exploratory um, uh, interpretations, you could say. So the cave itself is permanently closed to the public and this digital version has now been seen by about a million people worldwide. It's traveled a lot and was really considered very seminal in terms of what you can do with um, heritage material. We also created four other versions and I'll show you just a couple. Um, this is the AR version. So we print the wireframe from the laser scan on the walls of this exhibition booth at one-to-one -one scale. And then visitors are walking inside the digital model. Uh, it's like a window on the world, um, examining these murals in great detail. Why this is important to talk about in, in the museum sense is the way that it harnesses socialization around a single screen, as you can see here. Um, originally done for Art Basel in Hong Kong, it's also been to many, many countries. 
Um, and the phenomenon is largely the same. Groups of people form, they interpret, they move around in the space. Also, it's important to design interfaces for young kids or middle-aged ladies or grandmother and grandchild. Um, grandmother abandons the grandchild in this case and takes off with the screen. And one of the other noteworthy phenomena is this is the wife. She takes an iPad from her handbag and she's filming her husband's experience um, as if they were really there. Virtual, virtual tourism. So these types of works, they either work standalone or they get um, installed in major cultural heritage shows. So this is a Tang um, exhibition uh, of work from Xi'an um, in Sydney in Australia. And we've done an enormous amount of evaluation as we look at these um, the relationship between the digital object and its aura and the real object um, in these contexts. We also oh, created a full dome version. This was done uh, for the World Economic Forum, the Winter WEF, as it's called, um, a Summer WEF, actually, which is uh, held in China every year. And inside this, um, a monk and I, we're doing live tours under the dome, um, interactive tours for all of the WEF delegates talking about um, various aspects of the, of the mural paintings. And we're also very interested in large scale databases. And uh, as we know, moving image archives and sound archives are the major sort of memetic records of the 20 and 21st century. Um, and while these are enormous to digitize, um, the sheer size and the temporal nature of this material means that the, the custodians of this material have really big problems around access. Copyright restrictions alone are also very complicated. And so most of the large scale moving image archives are, um, can, can only be shown not on the internet, but in physical settings such as libraries and in museums where you get to access a database essentially. So what we're interested in is how this can be reformulated and different forms of narrative. So this demonstrator project is old, it's 2008, so it's 12 years old now. Um, and it takes 24 hours of free-to-air broadcast TV footage. Um, it analyzes that footage by software. Every time there's a camera angle change, there's a cut made in the movie. So out of five channels, we end up with 24,000 clips over a 24-hour period, and they're about four seconds each. So a bunch of guys are hired to sit in a dark room and hand tag each one of these four second clips. The tagging is very idiosyncratic. Um, it was built as an artwork. You could not actually use machine learning that easily to replace this kind of process anyway, or not yet. Um, we're talking about emotion, expression, physicality, more obvious things that could be detected with machine learning like gender and color and so on are also there. So we stream 500 simultaneous streams of video to the 360 system. And then the guy that is um, controlling it at the moment, uh, every time he clicks on one um, image, it goes in and it brings everything that's semantically most similar to one side. I'll just turn it down. And everything that's most dissimilar is behind you. Um, so that's the semantic architecture of how it works. Um, and he will bring up a screen here and start to weight the search. So in this case, it's going to be color because it's really obvious for demonstration purposes. You clicks on the fiery red stuff, it's based on luminosity. Um, so all the high, high luminous um, images come to one side of the screen. And what we see behind him in this case are all of the titles 
um, all of the black and white images that were part of um, the, the prelims for the movies and the credits at the end. Um, you can also add clips together in this system. So you're, in a way, um, creating your own narrative movie out of all sorts of different sets of movies. Um, and you save this, and then you can play, play it through. This is um, built for Museum Victoria. They have a 360 3D system. It's an export from the content management system. So it takes 15 minutes to get the data to build this. It's 100,000 objects, although the museum has 16 million objects. Um, and it's addressing the fact that most museums only show a fraction of their collection. So in Museum Victoria's case, it's 0.8% uh, of the collection. Um, you can select any of these images, zoom into them. They are all connected to other images using the metadata. We took about 25 fields. Um, you get the, a Wordle um, of the, the description in the, um, in the database and you can also access the original record if there is one. Um, so here we're making very explicit relationships for the public between 18 themes and crossing uh, natural sciences with indigenous material and social history. Um, so it's kind of like a real-time curating machine. There is no search engine, and we're often not working with search engines, although it's you know text-based ones because we're really um, working with outside of the didactic curatorial framework to produce some other types of experiences. Um, and I'll show you another example here of that. This is a work that I just finished actually for um, an exhibition at Art Lab, which is the EPFL Museum. Um, I direct this museum and uh, this is the Montreux Jazz um, uh, archival material. EPFL digitized it. It's 11,000 hours of video. Um, and I took just the, um, the jazz out of that material. So we ended up with 5,400 artists and 13,000 videos. And we created a social network based on the um, number of times any individual played with another individual. So link strength is based on this. What it ultimately means is if you're at the center of this network, you played a lot, and that's BB King. Um, and if you're on the periphery, you're not very um, jazz collaborative. So. That's the Art Lab building, in fact, where this exhibition was. It's in the full dome. Um, it's got a spherical interface, um, which allows people, it, it's a sort of emulation of the hemisphere of the, um, of the dome. And uh, the paradigm here is you're really like tuning a radio. You're panning around all these tiny audio clips. Um, associated with this neural net, and then um, you go into all the songs that were played by that particular group, and then you'll go into an individual song. So I just let it play. And at this level, you get the entire movie from the beginning. Um, Uh, so this also works on a kind of uh, single-user, multi-spectator model um, and uh, where the interface is shared amongst strangers. In some cases, it's rolled along the floor. Um, 
This archive has been, it's a memory of the world, UNESCO memory of the world, but there's been some interesting experiments done on it. And it's probably worth mentioning this one um, because here two songs were taken, um, Smoke Over the Water by Deep Purple and Miles Davis's Tutu. And both of these were encoded into synthetic DNA sequences. And then they have been de-encoded and you can listen to them at, at the museum actually at Art Lab. Um, so what it means uh, in theory is that um, you can store the entire archive in a grain of sand um, rather than wrecks of uh, servers and you can um, store the whole data of the world let's say in a um, in a single suitcase so for museums and for um, archives this radical repositioning in the storage of data is um, is also going to reposition how objects move in time and space and uh, I always tell it as a feel-good story for museums because they're always very anxious about how much digital data is taking up in on their servers. Um, the archaeology of the body, if you like, is part of the next section and it looks at intangible cultural heritage and the processes of digital documentation, reproduction and transmission in museological contexts. So intangible cultural heritage expressions are enacted, socially transmitted and intimately linked to people. And these practices, oral traditions and performances are defined by their reliance on tacit or embodied knowledge systems. Hong Kong uh, is an extraordinary reservoir, of, if you like, of um, intangible heritage and it's primarily of the Hakka people um, so from the early to mid-century, um, Hong Kong was provided refuge for teeming thousands of immigrants from mainland China. And amongst them were some of the most prominent martial artists in the world. So, but with globalization, urbanization and dwindling numbers of practitioners, this living heritage made internationally so famous by Jackie Chan, Gordon Liu, Hong Kong cinema in general, is now on the edge of becoming lost. So this was really the community coming to us and saying, what can you do with new technologies um, to, to help with transmission? So we started to do all sorts of filming. We had a mocap lab, so we started to do that too. This began in 2012. And um, we're working with 33 elite masters across 19 different styles of Kung Fu and really recording their Tao Lu, their training practices. Um, this is Oscar, both his father and grandfather were Kung Fu masters of note. And uh, it's very fast, very precise. Um, so we have now hundreds of these sequences, um, which can be automatically annotated. So motion over time analysis. Um, and then we started to document lots of other things, um, the entire sort of cultural repertoire. We've had now nine exhibitions worldwide and the Hong Kong government is looking at building a museum and research center for this. These are just a couple of the posters from these various exhibitions. Um, they've been worldwide actually. Um, one of the, Systems in the shows uh, is this reactor system. It's rear projected. You're looking at a single performance, but the way in which the annotations happen on the screen is different for all six screens, depending on who's interacting and what they want to see. Um, so these are just a series of simple motion analyses, um, uh, basic stuff. Um, this is speed at any moment on the body. Um, so these are different aesthetic um, frameworks for understanding motion and time. And uh, of course, 
going right through to highly aestheticized um, abstractions and motion graphics. Uh, this is, these are photos of Lam Sai Wing. He was um, the first fight choreographer in Hong Kong uh, to, and master to use photography in studio training. So we had photos of him. We had no video, but we had photos. We also had drawings of him. Um, so we created a 3D model and applied the motion capture data set um, to it from his great great grand nephew. The actual style is iron wire boxing. It's a very <laughs> slow chi building exercise. <laughs> and this stands life size in the galleries. Um, <laughs> quite strange, actually. Quite a weird archival object. Um, Pose matching in some of these shows uh, where the visitor has to strike and create a correct pose. Uh, we do a 500 to 1,000 frame a second video because a lot of them are moving very fast. This is Yao Wen Wa. Um, he's in his 80s. He's like the pinup boy of the Kung Fu Masters. He's really amazing. Um, so we filmed this in different ways. Uh, we've filmed all of their weapons. Um, so here, they're very crude, these weapons. Um, most of these people were farmers in China and then forced out. So they trained on very basic implements. Um, so we've done all of those as well, uh, a lot of green screen work, and then ritual culture. So this, in fact, is a Jiao festival, um, which is a very rare festival, actually, and it's, it's related to invoke a blessing after there's been a major plague. Um, so, in fact, it's also very kind of uh, related to coronavirus times. Um, and it's only held once every 10 years or so. And these massive dragons and unicorns, which is a totem of the Hakka people and uh, different types of filming. So this was uh, Hong Kong in, um, in the 70s, so a typical clan meeting in Hong Kong. But what you see today is in fact this. So in the middle of this group is Master Lam, Hong Kong, Haka master and uh, Hung Kun master. And these are his Czechoslovakian group, right? That all fly to Hong Kong. So they're mainly Europeans are learning these new, um, the, or these repertoire from these masters and not, not Chinese people. Um, the remaking of the Confucian Rites is a project we're doing together with Tsinghua University. It's also focused on the Chinese body to recreate specific rituals which haven't been performed for hundreds of years. And Confucian Li is a concept that covers the realms of aesthetics, ethics, and ideology. It's also a technique of the body, a skill that is learnt and inscribed. And in these sequences, the uh, capping ceremony, um, the actor's exact movements have been scientifically documented, if you like, using digital video, motion capture, turntable recordings of actors, um, their costumes, and all the modeling of the ritual utensils. So it's based on a close reading of fifth century texts by Professor Pang and his team. So they're philologists. Um, they work with archaeologists um, and historical collections to create the costumes. And uh, we either go there or they come to us and we do all this filming and then ultimately create um, a range of visual solutions to offer the highest level of interpretive appreciation where the exact articulation of movement, gesture and meaning can be interactively studied by the user. Um, it finds its way around the world. This is for the opening of the China Exchange in London. 
um, into the contemporary art world. This is the Serbinia Biennale. Um, and then this is at the Art Institute Chicago um, for a classic object show. So in fact, these works um, have many, uh, many outcomes in exhibition and film format, but also in interactive format. And just to give you an idea of the scale of this enterprise, um, needless to say, we've only done three out of 17. Um, but uh, this is a, a pseudo green screen studio, if you like. And all of the um, architecture and the surrounds are removed and replaced by computer graphics, ultimately, in the final versions. This is Professor Pang and his team. Um, training the Beijing Opera here, so very um, precise and wonderful actors um, that can do pretty much anything, and then a range of different ways of filming in odd circumstances. Um, and this is uh, an example, very early, but of how you replace the, the scenery with computer graphics. Um, and that project is ongoing, obviously, because there are still 14 rituals to, to complete. Um, and my interest there is how we turn it actually from this kind of big screen setting, um, this one, into much more of a virtual production model. So in fact, we end up with maybe three or four actors, small green screen studio, motion capture, etc., and that we film and then create in computer graphics um, pretty much everything uh, and uh, do new rituals based on that, that set sequence of movements. So that's a kind of ambition there, um, which puts it much more in the realms of um, affordability for other other people who might attempt to do this kind of work. Uh, and this is the final chapter. So it's a work in progress, this one. Um, the, it's the Atlas of Maritime Buddhism, and it's based on the compelling story of the spread of Buddhism from India through the seaports of Southeast Asia and the South China Sea, supported by archaeological and historical evidence that's never been brought together before. So um, it's got profound contemporary relevance, of course, to the socioeconomic and political transformations of the world through the South, through the Chinese government led One Belt, One Road project. And um, while this far reaching enterprise reactivates ancient overland and maritime trading routes, the Atlas counterbalances the prevailing narratives that neglect the importance of pan-Asian maritime countries and Buddhist entrepreneurship in the expansion of trade from the second century BC through to about the 14th century AD. Um, the spread of Buddhist doctrines from India to China triggered a profusion of cross-cultural exchange that had profound impact on Asia and world history. And it was a very complex process that involved multiple societies, diverse groups of people, missionaries, itinerant traders, artisans, medical professionals. And while textiles make up a percentage of the material that was traded, um, black pepper in particular that found in South India was a major part of the commerce. So, in fact, if we look at maritime trade, we're more likely to be talking about a spice route than we are a silk route. Um, Buddhism was spread by sailors who took with them their votus talisman, but there were also intrepid monks from China and present-day Indonesia, and they, they played an important role in these exchanges between ancient India and China. Um, monks introduced new texts and doctrines to the Chinese clergy, carried um, and distributed Buddhist paraphernalia for the performance of rituals, and also made very detailed accounts, so extraordinary sociocultural records of their spiritual journeys. So one can take an example of um, 
Jing uh, from the seventh century, and he went from China to India via maritime routes in a journey that took 25 years. So he brought back 400 translated Buddhist texts and extensive travel diaries. Um, he went to Nalanda, the great um, universities of Buddhism. He was in Srijavaya in, in Indonesia, Kedah in Malaysia, all major ports. Um, it's also clear at this time the huge esteem that China had for India. Um, it was a very, very um, reverential. India was seen as the source of great knowledge. So our work starts in the rock cut caves of India, um, and its pan-Asian spatially and temporally enabled sources are significantly diverse in format, ranging from these archaeological materials to travelers' accounts and historic gazettes. Um, and the purpose of the project is to develop this narrative deep mapping schema for being able to access hundreds of sites um, and hundreds of objects, as it turns out. So um, we're working across 12 countries. We've done thousands of locations, and we record them in um, ultra high res 3D um, panoramic and then monoscopic spherical imaging. Uh, many of these are World Heritage Sites, um, and there's a myriad of agreements that sit around all of this. And then we make um, 3D models as well. Um, this is the camera, actually, that we're using a lot, um, which is very not digital. It's an uh, analog camera. It's a Swiss camera. And the reason that we use it is the images that we can get out of it um, can be scanned to pretty much any resolution, and our systems are much higher resolution than, in fact, digital stereo rigs are able to capture. So that's the reason for that. Very light field work team. There are just three of us. We manage four cameras, and we undertake ambisonics at the same time. Um, this is the Schwagadam Pagoda. You can see on the left-hand side the, the transparencies that we're working with. Shwagadam Pagoda is in Yangon in Burma, and actually the top of this stupa is encrusted with about two and a half thousand rubies. Um, so it's an extraordinary site, very um, important relic site. Um, these are the earliest known agrarian Buddhist uh, stupas in, uh, in, of the Pew Kingdom, also in uh, Burma. Um, gigapixel imaging of the standing Buddha that predicts um, the creation of Mandalay in Burma. Um, these are sculptures, beautiful sculptures at a very remote site called Sanati in, um, in India, depicting King Ashoka, who uh, was the king who transformed India through the written word. These are, you know, many of these are world heritage sites. This is Nalanda, the um, the great university in Bihar, fifth century. This is the stupa at Sanchi, the oldest Buddhist stone structure in India. Um, this is Anura Dipura, which is um, a, the largest brick structure in the world. So the incredible sites. This is uh, monsoonal Ayutthaya in Thailand. Uh, and we've pretty much finished. We've been doing field work for four years, and we're almost at the end. Um, how this work will be depicted is, uh, is has yet to be built, but I'm just trying to give you an idea here. It's uh, You're out at sea, um, and then you enter into a country. Um, you can navigate inside this country layer, inside these stereographic panoramas. Um, like so, um, and then you're really inside, and then that's augmented, or that was the original plan, was to augment this with all of the archaeological material that um, is uh, associated with these particular sites. This Bay of Bengal ar archaeology is really booming. Um, but in fact, the data is still very fragmentary. And uh, in the end, I'm not sure this will work for a mass public. I think it's too fragmentary. 
So what we've also been doing is um, uh, photogrammetry of very important objects throughout these regions. So um, here via uh, Jayavarman VII from Angkor in Cambodia from the National Museum. Um, this is uh, also Cambodian. Um, and they, these are sonified objects. Um, and here, uh, this is a uh, bodhisattva in the form of Avalokiteshvara, and this is the most important Buddhist sculpture in uh, Sri Lanka today. It's from the National Museum of Colombo. And the worship of Avalokiteshvara um, was uh, extremely important for, for sailors going to sea. And by the time Avalokiteshvara reaches China, he actually go, undergoes a gender shift and is transformed into Guayin, which is a sea goddess. And this is in Putoshan um, on the coast near Shanghai on the major shipping routes um, to Taiwan. Um, and in the late 14th century, um, this island or this location became um, the center of worship for that bodhisattva. Um, the first installation of this work will be, uh, it got delayed because of coronavirus, but um, uh, fortunately, uh, it will be in May next year to coincide with the Buddha's birthday. Um, and this is a uh, the largest monastery in the world, and their museum gets an estimated 10 million visitors a year. So um, it'll be a, it's a permanent installation of this work for this location. Um, right. So that is in fact the end of the speech. So I'm sorry about the the small. Uh, interlude that we had when my computer went flat and wouldn't restart um, but uh, um, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any we have, um, a, we have a chat a chat uh, yeah sure for everybody. I, uh, uh, in the meantime, while we are waiting, so maybe I will I will ask question as uh, usual. Uh, could you t during this, this years of work on on the cultural heritage? Uh, yeah. Uh, from the side of of computer science, you know, how many new uh, new uh, technical obstacles you you were you sort of uh, faced with, and how many sort of how often does it happen that you have to figure a new algorithm or find find new new ways of, of uh, combining data of, uh, right. or store data on the technical mm -hmm. level and algorithmic level yeah. uh, computer science i think actually the a lot of the changes are um, related to a desire for a new kind of aesthetics and uh, so rather than focusing on technology per se, um, it's, the, it's the aesthetic parameters. And as, as techniques emerge, we, in a way, uh, have to mold these techniques into our world of understanding. Um, obviously, the, 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 um, the resolution that we're often working at are beyond what the market is um, producing uh, in terms of cameras and things. So there's a lot of um, uh, effort put into the, the super high resolution, which not many people are doing. Um, so that's certainly a difference. Um, we are definitely using machine learning on an almost um, regular basis now. Um, for all sorts of things from pixel improvement to image analysis and so on and to automation of, of search experiences. Um, 
And the other thing that we're working on is this idea of the internet of big machines. So it's really big scale VIS systems, which are networked together that will allow for um, collaborative research. Um, and working out the good use cases that are, are for science, not for um, culture, is also a really important part of that process. Um, and the reason that I moved to EPFL actually was to be able to work with some of the best scientists in the world to improve what we were doing um, because they really excel at certain aspects of computer science, specifically, you know, deep learning tools. Right. Yeah. So actually at uh, uh, ICM, we have, uh, we don't have uh, similar uh, facilities as you, of course, but uh, uh, with, we've installed collaborative visual uh, collab uh, tools in, in a way of uh, Sage 2 and some sort of 16 screens. And so I encourage if, if there's anybody in, in Warsaw uh, listening to this seminar and, and would like to, to see whether if any sort of collaboration is possible, I encourage you to explore. Talk to Professor Kandendine and to us. Uh, at least there is a sort of fragment of, of visualization uh, yeah. Very interesting visual uh, capability here at ICM. Uh, we have a question from uh, a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. One is, uh, can you see it, Sarah? Yes. Uh, have you already observed speed up of museums or other cultural institutions um, around or digitization due to COVID-19? So I absolutely, it's a really, really important topic. And um, what has happened is uh, museums rushed to embrace the internet. They should have done it before, but now they're doing it. Um, so we definitely see um, a massive interest in museums in their digital data, which wasn't there before. Um, but what I would also say is that in the 90s, we built more interesting websites and did more experimentation than you ever see today. Um, what we've seen largely is brochureware online. Um, the video podcasting kind of world is is good, the liveness, bringing liveness. But, you know, in the 90s, we used to broadcast shipwreck excavations from the bottom of the ocean, you know, to people's living rooms. Um, so what I'm hoping is that the getting museums back on the web in an interesting way is what will come out of it, that their audiences are really um, uh, demand new, uh, new forms of engagement, not brochureware or databases, you know. Um, and the other aspect of the COVID situation is the, the importance of the visitor in animating spaces, physical spaces. And so I see this renaissance of interest in visitors themselves and often in local community visitors um, because it's not possible to travel in the same way. So suddenly your audience is not your international audience, but your, your local audience. And I think this is a really interesting time for museums to re-embrace their visitors as well as um, up their game in the digital space. Right. So we have a, uh, another question, kind of similar to my question from Piotr. Do you know of any examples of new computer science algorithm technologies uh, that were explicitly developed for motivated by your work? Ah, that's a good point. Um, I mean, the ones that we have made have been made for us, I guess. Um, but whether we drive, I, I would say that the, you know, the work that I showed you, the paradigms of these works are very seminal, yeah? The fact that the, um, uh, the experience of um, heritage in different formats these are, have become quite paradigmatic in a way, but they're also very idiosyncratic. Um, we could say that T Visionarium was a very good example of prescience in the sense that 
mass moving image archives are impenetrable. So how do you deal with it? Um, and this was a, a mechanism to, to give fragments, to talk about interactive narrative and that sort of thing, which um, we will continue that work, but in fact, we will use a whole new framework of machine learning, specifically enhanced by curatorial knowledge, but automated to try and give access to those materials. So that's slightly not quite your question, but um, it's certainly this oscillating world. Now, thank you. There are more questions here from... Uh, yep, Keith Tomb. So this um, machine learning was what is called deep physically based rendering. Um, and uh, it was developed by um, actually a, a backshed guy um, who uh, is working in New Zealand on these particular tasks. So I can point you to his website if you want to look into the actual machine learning methods. What, what they were able to do was that the, the tomb, which is on two floors, um, um, were captured using photogrammetry in eight hours. And then the machine learning was used to detect certain elements in the imagery, um, which were uh, things like air conditioning units, uh, stairways, this kind of thing. And then to replace those um, sort of um, non-authentic elements with, with fill-in data. So I believe that it took six weeks from the day that the data set was complete um, to the actual model. And then what we did with it was we put it into um, uh, Unreal Engine using N display across our cluster. So I believe it was the first um, time that end display had been used in such a, a way you know this is a synchronization framework for clusters um so that's that project um yeah um next question is what metadata standards are used okay so um i mean there are various ones uh, ones that are already exist, like museum databases, and we're often working with, you know, Dublin Core or CDOC CRM, these kinds of things. Um, most of our work is not connected to international databases because most of this is very, very copyright encrusted. So. Um, while there's a desire, I guess, to share things that are in terms of intangible heritage, these are all living practitioners and they don't want their data spread around on the internet. And then with World Heritage Sites, there is a lot of rights management. Um, with the Dunghuan Academy, for instance, um, it's, it's very, very strict. Um, and so every time we show an instance of these works, we have to get permission, obviously. Um, and similarly, uh, with all the stuff that I've been doing on the Atlas, there's a lot of copyright um, and vested interests and stakeholders who have not yet embraced this idea of sharing. But the um, especially in cultural heritage, um, the... Uh, for intangible heritage, there are no standards. And what I've been trying to um, get towards and get somebody to fund actually is how you create standards for, for motion data for cultural heritage um, and to create the right ontologies. And I will actually um, have a PhD working on this topic about ontologies and, and mocap data for the Kung Fu project specifically um, into the future. And in that case, we'll probably work within the CDOC CRM framework, mainly because it, it works in two museums as well. Right. So we have a question very closely related to ontologies. And, uh, and can mm -hmm. you explain how you store uh, digitized data? As far as I understand, you use semantic annotations. What is the underlying technology databases, right. search engines? Yeah. So it's all a bit idiosyncratic, um, I would say, because um, different 
um, different partners, but also I've been working in like five different locations. Um, so each time I go somewhere, I, um, I work with a, a different infrastructure. Um, with the Kung Fu data, um, we are just beginning at the very beginning really of the semantic annotation, but I think it's a super important um, uh, moment where we can start to prove how, how valuable this is and how it might move from one data set to another to create that, uh, I guess, ontology for that. Um, in terms of databases and search engines, again, it just depends on which location we're in. If we look at the, um, I think maybe a good example is the Montreux Jazz Archive at EPFL. So it's all stored in an, in an active, a massive data store. Um, and then things happen with it, like there's live archiving, which goes from the um, festival onto the EPFL servers in real time, more or less. Um, and uh, so these are, these are um, it's an S3 um, Amazon data store that hosts all this material. Um, and then uh, the metadata that surrounds that, I think there are about 30 fields of metadata on that. And it's a custom built interface for Actually, uh, Sarah, uh, let me sort of interject. I believe that uh, some of this work for, for, from uh, from uh, Montreux Jazz Festival was uh, yeah. featured in the uh, HGST company uh, a movie about the storage technologies. Right. Of just storage. And yeah. it just happens that we have the same technology in Warsaw. Okay. <laughs> we don't have the music, but uh, yeah. Uh, that's so that's, kind of, um, we we have the same technology for storage. Yeah, Western Digital, right? Yes, right, correct, Actually. correct. We have the same thing here. Yeah, so they've been extremely generous um, to the archive and have, on an ongoing basis, been supporting it. Um, but there is this move to um, to the S3 Amazon right. server in the it, right now. Actually, um, uh, the the Montreux Jazz team are moving into my warehouse as well. Um, so we're building up this kind of um, big uh, big cultural archive sort of enterprise um, down in the warehouse. So you must come and visit, actually. Um, that would be really great. Yes, uh, that would be lovely, of course, uh, when COVID uh, is over. Uh, we have another question from Marek. Okay, so um, games engines, we, I mean, we did used to do a lot with Unity, um, but increasingly um, I, I work and I'm interested in the Unreal Engine um, and the Atlas of Maritime Buddhism, I think will be done in Unreal now that we have this synchronization framework um, around the, for the cluster. So, um, and do we collaborate with the game development community? Uh, to a degree, I mean, often the people that we are hiring are ex-game game developers. Um, and so uh, absolutely at one level, we inherit their skills um, in terms of both graphics and story form. Um, we don't explicitly have the same, um, uh, we don't implement what is commonly described as sort of the game theory, if you like. We're not busy with that, although I do have colleagues who are, most certainly. Um, and uh, ours is slightly more idiosyncratic and slightly more driven by um, the aesthetics of the data and what you can do with it rather than um, necessarily a reward type game scenario, um, getting from A to B or accomplishing A to B. We do do pedagogical training in immersive systems um, and that's a bit more goal-based. Um, but uh, the storytelling in a sense is, um, 
it's about exploration and the way in which the knowledge of that site is imparted to the visitor can happen in different ways actually and it's not usually text on screen it could be uh, in some instances a kind of voiceover but um mostly people come into these systems to explore first or to have a docent led tours in the case of Dunhuang so it's a live commentary with a fully interactive scene. Um, yeah, so that's how they come to operate. So I will ask a question for, for uh, to to use your your achievements for, for in museum settings in the educational setting in a, in a school uh, in a, in a, with with students. You know. How yeah. could that be modified using virtual reality? Or augmented reality to give students anywhere around the world this sense of of, of being there, participation, this sort of connectedness to, to those artifacts, sites, and culture. So certainly, scalability is a really important thing. Like being able to go from the very big system into a head-mounted display with the same content easily. Um, and we've done what uh, quite a bit of work. I had a very big grant in Hong Kong between all of the universities to, to devise a kind of immersive pedagogy. So what were the training modules you would need to teach engineering, you would need to teach uh, geology, cultural heritage. We had five or six demonstrator projects um, and the specialists in that area worked um, to create these in different locations. And at the time, uh, I mean, we had big systems in Hong Kong and Sydney. We connected systems together and we also did peer to peer. So we had students in different countries buddy up. Um, uh, so they had a, a student on the other side um, of the sea. Um, that they could talk to in relation to an immersive experience. But that was two big systems together. Um, and then we devised a prototype, but I never saw it because I left Hong Kong, which was really, okay, you've got um, an elite viz system. How do you have a similar experience, but just in your classroom? And, um, it was at that time that the Pico projector was emerging. And um, so we devised a framework where you were using multiple Pico projectors to simulate a kind of immersive experience. Um, in general, the advent of the head mounted display is very useful um, for these kinds of um, distributable, if you like, experiences. Um, so that it could be in your school or it could be. Um, even in your home. As we know, head-mounted display is sort of a bit goes and then it doesn't go and then it goes a bit further. So um, we'll see what happens next, how ubiquitous that might become. Right. So do we have uh, other questions? It looks like, uh, oh, yes, there's Louisa. Oh, uh, Louisa. Uh, is asking first of all she thinks can you see it yeah sure sure um yes uh thank you for the interesting seminar what do you think about museums of the future for example dubai berlin in berlin do you mean the the um the humble forum i'm not sure museum of the future in dubai actually amazingly i was uh, asked if i wanted to take the directorship of that one um a verbal is museum future a verbal discrepancy um you know there's a a post-colonial theorist called homi baba and he says that culture which museums are culture culture is ba is really the result of insurgent acts of cultural translation. So culture only ever exists through a um, transformation of heritage or things like this. Um, so in a way, um, you could say museum now, because these things are now, um, but uh, museum future, I think it's also possible to talk in these ways um, that 
the, the museum as, as a forecaster for the future. The museum in Dubai, Museum of the Future, um, was based around introducing to um, mass public new technologies as they're emerging into the, into the public use or even into the scientific domain so that you are, you are future forecasting through your museum experience. You're giving people a taste of the future. And I, so I think that they're not, um, it's not an oxymoronic statement um, because really museums are not so much a place of old dusty things anymore, but they are, they are future casting. They're also places of where community gets to experience um, things, whatever they might be, and that could equally be the future as well as the past. Thank you. Maybe I will ask uh, another question, if I may. Uh, sure. Sarah, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by sort of uh, unity of humankind. Of course, when you show Aborigines and people from uh, from Southeast Asia or China, there, there are vast cultural uh, differences, but, but there's also huge, uh, you know, unifying themes. And, uh, you know, I, I, for four years, I was sort of having this uh, uh, vision of combining all sorts of data, the data that the, uh, you collect and, and, and display and modify and, and uh, create, but also data from, from uh, uh, text, literature, from uh, from from verbal narratives, Absolutely. from genomics, from from and even things like uh, uh, phenotypes. You sort of you have images of people and they represent artistic and uh, representations, but also in sort of human remains and and how that ties together with yeah. uh, with genomics, with the language, with the material artifact with development of culture, with human movement around the world, all of this combined. Yeah, I, I totally agree that that's a wonderful vision, actually. And it is a kind of uh, deep mapping, if you like. It's the many, many, many layers of um, the world and phenomenon that can all come together. In the, in the 19th century, you know, the museums they were the Wunderkrammer, where they were exploring both objects of art and science together. So these, um, uh, the synergies between very, very diverse um, materials are in fact much closer than we imagine. And I think also, you know, it's a bit systems thinking as well, um, where um, to explore a single object, in fact, is to explore the whole of geology and, you know, the forces that acted on rocks and um, all the other things, the, the philosophies and the movements of history, um, right through to that moment where you engage with the object. So I think also this, these notions of the Anthropocene and the ability to look at deep history um, which is not just deep history in the historical sense, but also in the scientific sense, um, the sediments of, uh, of times and forces that act upon them. So I totally agree. It's a wonderful vision, and, and that could be the museum of the future. Indeed. Right. Yeah. Right. So I think, I think there are no, no more questions, and uh, we really appreciate your time. Sorry, that, was, that was absolutely, you know, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm sure that I, I speak for every participant of, of the seminar that we're absolutely thrilled with, with your work and the, how wonderful it is. And we would like to learn more. And of course, uh, when opportunity is better, you feel most welcome again in the Warsaw, because we've met in Warsaw last time. No, no, that was great to meet you. So that would be fantastic. To, to see each other again and and uh, uh, with that i thank you very much a pleasure and thank you and sorry about the quite technical hitch no uh, worries pretty obvious one no electricity <laughs> thank you uh, very much and uh, let me thank you very much and uh, with, with please allow me to uh, go through a few reminders uh, again at the at the end of our uh, session.
uh, I will I encourage you to mark your calendars and also spread the word and, and inform, uh, uh, let your friends and colleagues and other students and uh, your circle know that uh, we'll have, uh, again, very interesting, fascinating talk next week. Uh, the same, uh, Not the same time. Please note that the time is different. It will be uh, 7 p.m. 19.00 uh, uh, Central Euro European Standard Time. And the reason is that uh, Stephen Wolfram lives on the west coast of, of USA. So, and uh, maybe he's not such an early riser. So, uh, we have to adjust. And uh, so, that will be slightly unusual time. Also, this will be the last uh, uh, seminar in our uh, current series. We'll, we'll uh, make a break for. Uh, summertime. Uh, let me here acknowledge uh, support of our media partners, Data Nami, HPC Wire, Enterprise AI, IT WIS, Sztuczna Inteligencja, Computer World. Uh, now, if any of you have missed the previous seminars, you're most welcome to browse through our uh, past seminars web page. Uh, all seminars are recorded including today's uh, seminar. If uh, any of your friends missed it, also please uh, help us advertise our series. We'll come back in September, most probably. Uh, but uh, the last week, uh, last uh, Thursday in June, we're not running any seminars because we don't really want to uh, create any clash, any uh, competition with our friends uh, who are organizers of ISC 2020 International Supercomputer uh, Supercomputing Conference in Germany, usually in Frankfurt this time in virtual space. I encourage all of you who are interested in computing, supercomputing, HPC, please register. It's a free event. Uh, the, the program can be found under this link. And Thursday is the day of workshops. So most certainly you can learn a lot. Anybody can learn something. So please go and, and uh, find it for yourself. And so uh, we had the pleasure of uh, uh, listening to Professor Sarah Kenderdine today. And uh, with this, uh, thank you very much for your participation. And I hope to see you next week. Thank you.